Many places are still waiting to welcome people back. But in the meantime, this city has made the most of the measures being relaxed. Fiona Trotz, BBC News, Newcastle. Lots to talk about, mm. as ever. What impact will the changes have on the spread of the virus? What can you, can't you do? Um, all sorts of things. Let's speak now to our regular panel of experts, virologist Dr Chris Smith and Professor Linda Bold. Lovely to have you both Morning. on, as ever. Morning. Right, who wants to start? So we know that um, lots of things changed yesterday. Um, Linda, to you first. Um, what are your thoughts on that, the changes and the impact it could possibly have? I think this was the right time to start to ease, uh, to open up more things, hospitality outdoors in England, um, and obviously non-essential retail across big swathes of the country. Still waiting a wee bit longer up here, Louise, another couple of weeks until we've got more open here. But if you look at the seven-day average of cases, it's around 2,700 now, and that's about six to seven-fold lower than it was in January. As we've discussed before on this program, the vaccines really seem to be helping to break that chain between infections, hospitalizations and mortality. So we are making very good progress. The R though is just below one. Um, and we do expect there to be a rise in infection when we open up, but hopefully we can manage that while we continue to roll out the vaccine program. Of course, we've heard today that that target of offering vaccines to the over 50s has been met. Uh, Chris, we've just seen a, a piece showing what happened in Newcastle. And lots of our viewers have talked about um, you know, the issue of social distancing and uh, people being outside shopping in pub gardens, whatever that might be. And the government guidance still stipulates the importance of maintaining a, a, a safe distance. With that in mind and, and what Linda's just been saying, this feels like a real test of the vaccination programme. Uh, yeah, it does. I mean, we must bear in mind the virus hasn't gone away. And although we have got stupendously good results for the vaccine program so far, both in terms of how well these vaccines perform, they prevent severe disease, they prevent death in, in older, more vulnerable people, but they also appear to be breaking the chain of transmission, which is... Um, who has been offered the vaccine? Because this morning um, in England, for example, people over 45, also in vulnerable groups, are able to apply. We know that the website has currently been down because I imagine there's a lot of people that age um, <laughs> trying to get there you go, uh, trying to get on and book their vaccine. Um, and we know in Scotland and Wales, it's still being offered to over 50s. Northern Ireland, over 40s is already ro rolled out. And Chris, this is part of the sort of whole process, isn't it? Um, and each step, how significant is each step as it rolls down the age groups? Uh, well, I was very fortunate to receive uh, the Pfizer vaccine yesterday as part of the uh, drive to vaccinate healthcare workers. So that was my second dose. And, and I was very impressed by the way in which the, the whole vaccine rollout has worked and, and could therefore catch the infection. And even if they may not have a problem, because remember that half of people don't have a serious problem, may not have any symptoms at all, they can still give it to other people. So it's really important at the moment that we do not, as Jonathan Van Tam famously said, he's our Deputy Chief Medical Officer last year, don't rip the pants out of these guidelines. Yes, it's still one of the best quotes uh, from the last year or so. Um, and uh, on that issue of the website, it's important to say that uh, the advice is to keep trying, obviously, if you're over the age of 45 in England and trying to get on there to book your vaccination. Uh, Linda, and on that issue of, of vaccinations, the Moderna vaccine, which has been used already last few days in Scotland and in Wales, is now starting to be used in England as well. How big a tool will that be to add to that programme of vaccinations? So this is an important vaccine, also received a approval a while ago by the MHRA. The UK has ordered 17 million doses. It again has to be uh, cold stored, not as cold as the Pfizer vaccine, um, but still in cold storage. The trials are very encouraging, both against mild to moderate and against severe disease. Two doses, again, similar to the vaccines we're using at the moment. So it will be an important tool. Um, we've already started to deliver it in Scotland. I was just looking at the doses of Moderna that were given yesterday, already in Wales and then today from England. Um, and as we've been discussing on the programme before, Dan, now that the uh, advice has changed a wee bit for the under 30s who've not yet received their first dose, we may see more of those younger age groups receiving it. But just to emphasise a point that Chris just made, which I think is important, there is only about 14% of adults in the UK who've received both doses of a vaccine so far. So we really are not out of the woods yet in terms of the vaccine programme. Moderna is going to help. We might have the Janssen vaccine, Johnson & Johnson, coming on stream in the future as well. So moving in the right direction, but still only partial protection for many people. Um, So-called vulnerable groups are not being able to get a vaccine. What should they, what's your advice to them, do you think? 
Uh, we'll keep trying and be patient. GPs do know who you are. There is a big list of who the people are who need vaccination and they're working their way down it. But if you if you don't hear anything, then a phone call to your GP to say, well, where am I in the pecking order? Uh, how do I access a vaccine if I haven't been called up yet? Is anything wrong? Would be helpful, but please don't overdo it because the GP receptionists are also incredibly busy trying to help people with this very position. So, and when there's not obviously so much demand today. Yeah, I, I was just asking as well, Linda, in terms of you know all uh, all the processes that are going on at the moment, and Chris has talked about still being careful with um, you know the, uh, the um, social distancing when outside, when sort of reopening up of society. And we're also hearing, aren't we, about that surge testing taking place in, in some parts of London to try and contain a, a variant there? That's right. So this is the B1351, the South African variant. Now, people in South London will be familiar with this because both in February and in March, there were some surge testing in three to four postcode areas in Wandsworth and Lambeth. And now people are being asked to come forward again, actually a much bigger area. Um, identified still a relatively small number of cases of this variant. But it's really important. The messaging today is that you will be approached for a PCR test, which allows us to know genomically sequence whether it's the variant or another. Um, but what people can do today in those parts of London, even if they're not being offered that surge testing yet, is take up these lateral flow tests, which are now available to everybody in England. You can order them online, pick them up from a pharmacy or elsewhere. And crucially, if you do get a positive result, even from that test, particularly in that area, but everywhere, please self-isolate as soon as you can. Um, because that's if, if somebody has that variant, which may challenge our vaccines a little bit, certainly against mild and moderate disease, then the key thing is that self-isolation and people will get offered that surge testing in those areas very soon. Thank you once again uh, very much to the pair of you. Can I just ask, because you've become very familiar faces to millions of viewers on BBC Breakfast, and we always seem to do you together because you sort of form this formidable vaccine panel. Had you met before uh, this pandemic? Did, did you know much about each other before? We haven't met well, yet, just... have we? <laughs> we, we? We only know each other by staring at a webcam. We've never actually seen each other face to face or even on screen, in fact. <laughs> so we're, we're really looking we're really looking forward as I'm sure everybody is for lots of different aspects of their lives. I've got a few words to say to Chris about his clocks and all these kinds of things we tend to do on the weekend program. But yeah, I'd love to meet him in the future, but not yet. I hear as well that you're you're a sort of um, you're forming quite a partnership because you obviously you're the naked scientist, Chris, and it's Linda Bold. So is this true that you're now being PR'd as naked and bold? Is this the future? <laughs> It, yeah, it, I, yeah. I had it in my track record in that. <laughs> definitely some potential there. <laughs> Edinburgh Festival Fringe. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I look forward to it. <laughs> absolutely brilliant. Thank You'll yeah. know that you have people turning up. That's absolutely <laughs> fantastic with a name like that. Brilliant. Well done. Thank oh, you. Been, they have been fantastic, the pair of them, though, for they've, many months. They've as been well. guiding us through, haven't they? Right now, let's get the news, the travel, <laughs> and the weather wherever you are.